Well, thank you for the introduction, Mandy, and Gary, thank you very much for being here. You've worked for some very admirable companies, and it's great that we'll have a chance to hear a little bit from you. Um, obviously, we'll focus on your current company, National Geographic, but before we do, I've got to get the question out of the way, which is your favorite Muppet? That's a tough question, you know, because I, I, spoke, I gave the commencement address at the communication school at UT at the Irwin Center about seven or eight years ago, and uh, I had Cookie Monster with me. So I think the graduates probably have no memory of what I said, but everyone remembers Cookie Monster. And we did not make him into the vegetable monster, despite uh, what the rumors were at the time. Today, maybe you'd have to, right? But Grover was my favorite Muppet. Any other Grover fans out here? So there we go. Because he sort of, uh, he was, um, drove everyone a little crazy. So I, was, I related to that. I'm an Oscar the Grouch guy myself. <laughs> well, this is great. Um, we thought we'd start off by asking you some questions that would be uh, relevant for the students here who are contemplating their first jobs and uh, what it takes to have a great career like you've had and to succeed in business. Um, so could you tell us a little about your first job? Well, my first, first job was, you know, other than the lemonade stand, so to speak. <laughs> uh, I mean, I go back, I, I had an uncle who worked in Major League Baseball for the Angels, because I grew up out in LA. And I got to go to spring training every year as a eight-year-old, seven-year-old, nine-year-old. And I, he taught me kind of marketing, right? <laughs> at a very young age, just by hanging out with them. And I still can't go to a baseball game without thinking about the concession sales and things like that. <laughs> and everyone yells at me to just concentrate on the game, but I can't really do that. But the, then, you know, it was off to doing like real work. It was working at Baskin Robbins, you know, in high school and uh, scooping ice cream. And that taught me really what it meant to frankly, in customer relations and being able to uh, serve people who came in who had their peculiar likes and dislikes and disgusting flavor combinations and things like that. But, you know, as simple in a way as that job was, and I'm sure several of you guys out here have done that as well, it actually was a terrific way of entering into the workforce, and I was making $1.55 an hour, okay, back then. So it was, uh, but it taught me a lot of lessons about just serving customers and consumers. And from there was, you know, a whole set of career things, which I know you had to listen to a long litany here, which I apologize <laughs> for. But um, a lot of things were based on, you know, how I, how I got started. How did you choose your first job after undergraduate? Well, I actually went straight to law school. Okay. Um, but I had worked on the Daily Bruin, which is the equivalent of the Daily Texan here, and uh, it was, you know, a 30,000 circulation daily paper with advertising sales and publishing, and um, I probably shouldn't say this, but I don't remember a lot of the classes I took, most of it because I was sitting in that newspaper office uh, covering the world, and it was a great way of taking a large university down to a size that I could relate to and having access to the chancellor and other people who we got to interview, or coach John Wooden, who was there when I was an undergrad at UCLA and in the heyday of basketball. And, uh, you know, that, that really gave me, uh, journalism gave me a ticket, I think, Dean, to, uh, to not be shy about asking questions. Mm -hmm. um, it demystified authority, so to speak. Uh, it was also an era where the country was going through a lot of tumult in Vietnam and civil rights and things like that. So it was an era where a lot of people were questioning authority, not so different from today in that sense. And having that foothold in journalism, I think, uh, gave me a ticket to wanting to get involved in public policy, which led me to law school and then to Washington. And then as you, as you progressed on through your various careers, um, what, what was it that set you apart from the other people who would have liked to do the same things you wanted to do? Well, it's, a, you it's a good question. You know, no matter how, quote unquote, successful you end up, you still, I ask myself that question a lot. And, and I'm not sure. I mean, maybe it was a passion for making an impact. Mm -hmm. And I really 
Uh, I grew up feeling like I was, there's people in the world who positively impact the world, and then there's kind of everybody else. Yeah. And, uh, and I think you can each identify those people in your lives. And whether it's a relative or a friend or someone, a teacher, um, that person uh, is someone who I always try to admire, and I wanted to be one of them. And it was that choice, I think, of being proactive and putting yourself out there for uh, you know, the good and the criticism or whatever comes up with, but, but raising your hand and standing up. I think that was a lesson that I learned early on, and it didn't necessarily come naturally to me. I wasn't someone who always wanted to be the guy on stage and the lead in the play and all that kind of stuff. But over time, I learned that you had to stand up for what you believed in, and you needed to, uh, to stand up and to make an impact in the world. And I, I, you know, it's paid off to some degree. Good. So who, who do you admire the most? Well, that's a really good question. It's a very hard question to, to answer, because um, all of us are flawed individuals. <laughs> including business leaders, certainly political leaders. Um, you know, I, I, I've grown to admire people like Steve Jobs more as I've grown older, because I think his fearlessness uh, and his demand for excellence is something that I've come to greatly admire. But I can also admire a coach like Greg Popovich, you know, down in San Antonio who takes a bunch of guys who are not the highest paid players in, uh, in, uh, in basketball, mm -hmm. but makes an amazing team of people achieve greatness together. So I do take a lot of metaphors from sports, which drives my staff a little crazy. And I've had to explain to them, some of them, who the San Antonio Spurs <laughs> are. But, uh, but I do. Uh, I do admire people who demand excellence, and I also admire people who can get the most out of people and, and have them achieve something maybe greater than they can think they can achieve themselves. And I think you have that common thread in those two individuals who probably couldn't have been more different. Yeah, that's right. Um, is there something that you haven't mastered yet that you would like to, to master? Oh, there's a whole list of those things, but uh, I think, you know, if I had, I don't have a lot of regrets, but the one regret I have is not uh, learning how to play an instrument, hmm. a musical Is this instrument. inspired by South by Southwest? It is. <laughs> <laughs> and coming into Austin, you know, not being able to play guitar and sing at a barbecue place is, you know, I feel like a total loser. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but, you know, I'm, I do love music, actually, and I'm a big music fan. And uh, I've been to South by Southwest for the music in earlier years. And um, I've always wanted to be able to do that, and I just never got around to it, and it's sort of a regret. Any particular instrument? No. No? You know. All right. All right. So, so what's the biggest... Oboe, you know. Oboe? <laughs> You know, there aren't a lot of those in South by Southwest. <laughs> I've heard. There's a niche there, right? <laughs> yeah, Business absolutely. lecture, isn't rock, it? Rock oboe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so what's the biggest mistake you've made in your career? Oh, well, you know, a lot of CEOs who I've befriended have this standard line to that answer, which I've actually come to agree with. And it has to do with not trading out people early enough on a team who don't get it. And you always end up sort of regretting that you didn't move. So I've always tried to have this approach, as I said before, of getting the best out of people. But they've, they've got to want to go with you. Mm -hmm. And some people, uh, most people, will want to go with you. There's always a few people who don't share the same values, and that's OK. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean they don't have worth. But this isn't the place for them at this time. Mm -hmm. and, not, and being able to make that move, I think, is something that you know, I can point to a few occasions in my career where I should have acted sooner. Mm -hmm. And I think in business, um, that's something that's important, or whether you're you know, managing a, a, a team 
or whether you are uh, you know, running some, an organization or trying to get something done in government or whatever it is, I think it's really important that you've got partners with you who have different specialties who carry the same values that you have. Okay. So when you say don't get it, it's buying into the values, bringing the energy to the projects. Exactly. Okay. Um, when you took over uh, about a year, year and a quarter, a little yeah. over a year ago, right? right? Um, when you took over at National Geographic, you, the, uh, John Fahey, the person you succeeded in the position, said uh, that navigating the media disruption in the business model is something that you like to get into and talk about. And I just wondered if you could tell us how that perspective has then applied to your work at National Geographic. Well, it's changed everything, yeah. right? So who in the room today uh, reads a print newspaper every day? Two people, <laughs> come and see me afterwards. So, no, but, you know, and you telling folks to turn off their electronic devices or don't tweet is sort of an oxymoron. I mean, it is our world today. Uh, it is the way we communicate and the way we experience the world. And I'm not saying that's good or bad or indifferent. There's lots of people who have opinions about that. It is. And it's the same way Sesame Street got invented, which was, it wasn't a question of whether television was teaching. It was teaching. It was teaching about sugar sweetened cereal, and it was teaching mm -hmm. about things like Chef Boyardee beefaroni, and I can still sing, sing the theme song from that, which I won't do for you today. <laughs> uh, but it was teaching jingles. It was teaching all kinds of things, which is why the Sesame Street Let's use jingles and the power of advertising to sell letters and numbers, which is why the show is brought to you by the letter P and the number 12, right? <laughs> That's what's behind that. So uh, it, it was a question then of using skills from child development and baking that into a curriculum on the program. So that was 1969. Mm. So we now forward ourselves 40 or 50 years later and we're living in a world of total media disruption, a world where you know, this toy that Steve Jobs left us um, is changing, is changes our lives. Everyone knows the news all day long as it buzzes off in your pocket, right? So you know the basic headlines of the news, but so the, the, the work of a daily newspaper about this. So, you know, National Geographic's been around 127 years. So in the, not so long ago, you'd do this. You'd go to your mailbox on March 15th. You'd get the April issue of National Geographic. You'd read it cover to cover. If you really were inclined, you might let it write a letter to the editor, and one out of 1,000 might get printed. One out of 10,000 might get printed. And then you'd go home and wait for the next issue to come a month later. I mean, that sounds ridiculous today, right? And it is ridiculous. So we've had to change the news cycle from, a, we still publish a monthly magazine that does well globally. We've globally expanded into 41 local language editions, but we're also publishing weekly compilations, daily and hourly compilations, and we're now on platforms like Snapchat the five a day, you know, 10 second video pieces, which some of, I'm sure, guys in this room have looked at. But that's where we have to be. We've got to be platform agnostic if we believe in our work. And I think a lot about, if there's one issue that keeps me up is can we get there fast enough? Mm -hmm. So when you're dealing with a legacy organization, there's a lot, as you know, teaching, teaching this. There's so many brands that your parents <laughs> knew about and that you'll know about now that will disappear because the leaders just didn't adapt fast enough. So Kodak, good example. This was, we all grew up with Kodak moments. They, yeah. they were part of our lives. Kodak film cameras. They were in the digital game. They didn't make the switch. They're like pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. And Encyclopedia Britannica was the encyclopedia when we were growing up, mm -hmm. dead, right? They could have been Wikipedia, they wouldn't make the leap. The music industry um, had things called Napster. I don't know if you, some of you guys probably remember this. 
So that disrupted these big record companies like Sony and BMG and Warner Music and all these guys. They saw that train coming for a long time. So what was their reaction to dealing with the digital download of music? Sue teenagers <laughs> and bring them to court for copyright violations. That was a really good tactic. <laughs> that d didn't quite work. Yeah. So that entire industry has collapsed completely. And so now we have a, you know, a new entrepreneurial world where bands have to manage their own lives, do live performances, download music. You know where they're performing at South by Southwest. They're doing free concerts on KUT. They're doing all kinds of things. They're managing their own existences without that umbrella of those big record companies. So that what's happened to the music industry has now happened to the newspaper industry as a whole. There's a few exceptions, like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. But daily newspapers around the country are awful cuts. And the magazine industry is seeing 20 to 30% drop-offs in advertising, which are monumental numbers to try to hold an organization together. It's not making this digital transition. So this is true of Sesame Street. It's true of NPR. It's true of National Geographic. It's true of the Austin uh, newspaper, right? So it's true of all these things. And we, we as leaders in the media have got to figure out ways to make this transition. That's the biggest challenge we have. Mm -hmm. So as CEO of a company, it's one thing to recognize it. It's another thing to figure out what to do about it. Yeah. How, what's the process you go through? How do you do that? Well, you know, I came into National Geographic. I did sort of a listening tour. And uh, it was, uh, in many ways, like a college campus. I'm going to get myself into trouble here. <laughs> but you had the business school, the law school, the medical school. They didn't really talk to each other that well, right? Mm -hmm. Shocking as that may be to sound. But they were all connected under the University of Texas right? or National Geographic. So we had people doing science and exploration. We had people doing education. We had people doing journalism. They were totally disconnected. So what we did is we threw them all together and we said, what are we about? And we're about in inspire, illuminate, and teach. And this belief statement that you just saw in this video, we believe in the power of science, exploration, and storytelling to change the world. And getting that behind us and, and in front of the entire staff as an organizing principle was a first very important step. That took, that's taken the first year to really cement in. And uh, we now have a chief science and exploration officer who, who does the inspire you know, corridor, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We have a chief education officer doing teach. And we have a chief media officer who's in charge of uh, illumination or storytelling. Mm -hmm. And under that person, he has uh, digital and publishing and television and all the film and all the other things that we do in, in photography and storytelling. So these are big buckets of, of work, but they're, uh, they're, they're an organizing principle, and that's the first step that people get. But you know, it takes a long time, and it takes a long time to change cultures in organizations. Those that are 100 years old, or even Sesame, which was 40 some years old, they're, people get into a habit of doing things, and it works, and they win lots of awards. So every year, Sesame Street would win, still does, the preschool Emmy, you know, the Emmy for the best preschool <laughs> show on television. And every time that award show came around, I was like praying to God that we would not be lose it for the first time, OK? <laughs> because it, it was just a benchmark for, it's how they benchmark success every year. But what I had to convince them was that wasn't really the test. The test was whether a four-year-old girl in Dallas is bored and is turning the show off, right? That's what the test is. Mm -hmm. Because if she's not engaged by the educational messages of Elmo, or whatever it is, uh, we're not meeting our mission as a nonprofit organization. So I always try to focus on, uh, you know, on a consumer. Maybe it goes back to scoop and ice cream. I don't know. 
But is that person engaged with our work and content that is going to uh, keep them inspired to continue to uh, work with our, engage more with our content and participate in our content, which is what all of this digital media, after all, is about now. Um, another topic, how, how do you see the interaction between companies, society, and through corporate social responsibility? Yeah, so the other thing that's happening is the whole world advertising is going through a huge disruption. Mm -hmm. So in the old days, it was like, I'll buy a bunch of spots on the television network. I'll buy magazine ads, newspaper ads, and that doesn't work as much anymore, right? Because we're all, we all have media habits. I, I could guess the media habits of most of you folks in this room, and it's probably you're touching and pulling down from all kinds of different places all day long. I doubt if you're coming home and watching CBS all night. I mean, that's almost laughable, right? It just doesn't exist anymore. And it's cord cutting or cord never, as they call it, which I'm sure some folks in this audience have. Cable is even beginning to you know, have some uh, delay in terms of their uh, ability to grow. And, and it, it's, it's starting to corrode a little bit around the edges. As we're moving more from a prefix menu, so to speak, of media choices that some person in New York or LA is deciding what you're going to watch at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. And you're going to watch stuff when you want to watch it on whatever device you want to watch it. And you can watch 10 minutes of it or 45 minutes of it. And it's up to you. So the media companies, the advertisers see that world. It's scary to them. But if they're sitting there managing these budgets, figuring out how they're going to reach these folks in this room. And they know buying CBS for Monday night is probably not the best thing to do. So how are they going to figure out where to, where to place their bets, which is what they're doing, so that some ad for Nike is going to reach you, who, who happens to be a, a, a football fan and happens to you know, watch the, the Longhorns game or whatever it is. So it becomes much more of a niche play in terms of advertising. And those of us who have these platforms, whatever they are, like Comedy Central or National Geographic or NPR, whatever it is, we need to find partners who are getting the bigger picture now. So it becomes less about buying spot sale ads, so to speak, and much more about enterprise partnerships where people are buying into your values and they're trying to reach your quote unquote tribe, you know, your people who are committed to, uh, to what you stand for as an organization. So we have tens of millions of people around the world who believe in National Geographic. They root for National Geographic. There's millions of people, 35 million people a week listen to NPR around the country. There's people who are huge fans of Fox News and fans of CNN and Comedy Central or The Daily Show or whatever it is, they're part of their tribe, so to speak. And, and the question then becomes, how do you get Geico or Allstate con if connected to that group of people who are believing in your values? And it's a very different mindset than just buying a spot here and a spot there. And we've actually created, we've retitled our office as enterprise partnerships, because it's much more about corporate social responsibility and connecting with a company uh, like Rolex, who we work with around ocean preservation, or Shell, who we've done some work with in terms of just getting energy issues in front of the public without promoting an agenda. But it's just about an interest in getting some discussion and public affairs appointment around those mm -hmm. different yeah, So in a way, you're, you become an enabler of a message around corporate yeah. social responsibility. How do you deal then with, with the fact that perhaps you might not want to enable everyone who approaches you? Well, I, we're not going to you know, team up with people whose values we abhor. Yeah. I mean, but I think you know, we're, we view ourselves as a creator and a curator of, of content and ideas. And I felt this way at NPR. You know, the role there was not to tell people how to think. The role there was to report news and give people 
facts and opinions that they could make up their own mind on. So, and I feel the same way here about issues that we cover, which are more based in science and the environment and, mm -hmm. and history. So it's giving a, it is giving a context to the news that you're not probably getting from the, the headline that's buzzing in your pocket every 20 okay. seconds. All right, I think we have time for a couple of questions before we open this up so you can all be thinking of your questions. Um, what's the best piece of advice you were ever given? Uh, the best piece of advice was, hmm, that's a good question, uh, <laughs> eat your spinach. No, it was, uh, it was trust your instincts. Okay. That served you well as, as you've taken over these new companies? And... Yeah, I've never really, I, I have to say, I, you know, when I trusted my instincts, I was pretty much right. And when I got talked into stuff, Batten 500. <laughs> All right. And, and last question, what, what makes a person that, that, who you manage stand out to you as, as, as these folks are thinking about progressing in their careers? That's a really good question, and I, I think it's about desire. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about I want somebody who's, uh, who wants to make a difference in the world. It's some of the things I've talked about before, mm -hmm. uh, who, who is curious, who doesn't shy from working hard um, and doesn't think about working hard and doesn't think about days off, it, if you know what I mean. And I, we get into these issues around work-life balance a lot. And my view on that is not about some regal CEO making decisions about here's, you know, you, you shall work from 8.30 until four, 5 o'clock and thou shalt take every Friday <laughs> in the summer and whatever. It's much more about empowering people to manage their own lives and getting the work done. And I don't really care if you're here, you're doing it from some remote place, you're, it's about a job, you, I'm entrusting you to get something done and if it takes 20 hours, you're gonna spend 20 hours. If it takes two hours, you'll spend two hours. So I think it's that desire to to, uh, to work hard, and there is that old stereotype that you get, want to get something done, you give it to a busy person, mm -hmm. and that is really That's true. true. Yeah. Um, that is totally true running organizations, yeah. in my experience. Good. Well, thank you. Thanks. Um, we, we will open it up to questions now. There is, I believe, one mic right here, and you can just line up at this mic, and we'll take your questions until Mandy gives me the <laughs> signal that we have to end. Hi. Hi. Um, I grew up on National Geographic, and it inspired me to become a film major. Great. And now it's somewhere I would really like to work. It, it's the kind of stuff I want to go into, documenting the world. You know, it's, it's such a powerful thing. Um, I have a very important question for you, because I've been looking forward to asking the CEO of National Geographic this question my whole life. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. You, you, you've come to the right place. <laughs> So look, there's a couple of uh, things I would suggest you do, and then I'll tr I will try to answer a little bit or put in context the criticism, which I, which I don't discount, actually, uh, which is somewhat 
valid. Um, on the advice side of what to do, travel. And I don't mean go on a cruise ship. I mean travel. Get yourself to Asia, get yourself to Africa, go to around the world, Latin America, and see how other people do things. I think one of the things that happens here is we get so wrapped up in not seeing the way Japan's trains work that we can't even imagine what this a proper train system looks like in the world. But when you go there, you'll see with your own eyes and your own experiences. So that's really important. Uh, languages is another one. Uh, you know, I will always hire someone who speaks Mandarin or Spanish more than someone who has no language skills. It's just really important in a globally interconnected world that we live in. So those things, as students, is something you can do, do something about. And taking courses across the campus is the other thing. You know, when I went to UCLA, on a whim, and it was a total whim, I took a course in Chinese uh, history and politics. And it was like, it opened up this whole interest for me. And I found myself 30 years later building a children's television program in China. Like, I would have <laughs> wouldn't have never been, but it was serendipitous. So you go through that course catalog at UT, there is, look at it as a treasure trove of opportunities. You have a very, I sound like I'm talking to my own kids here, <laughs> or your, your age, but you have a opportunity for these four years to test the water in all kinds of things. Don't tell your parents I said this. <laughs> and take advantage of it. This is a great university with amazing professors. Take advantage and study things out of your box. That just, you know what? I've always been interested in you know, astronomy, but I don't know anything about it. Go check that out. Because it, it may totally open up a world that doesn't exist. So that's my advice, I think, on how to get a job at National Geographic. <laughs> <laughs> now, in terms of our you know, past, present, future, I, look, you have to remember National Geographic history. It was started in a completely different era, 1888. The first issue had art, really thrilling articles like the geological strata of the Potomac River. You know, it was a real page turner back then. <laughs> so, and it was really, frankly, a, you know, at a time when Britain was colonizing and Europe was colonizing Africa and. Uh, the white man's burden was part of what was going on around the world in India and Africa and other parts of the world. It was a totally different era back then. And I think some of that seeped into the pages of the magazine. It was part of, it was about an exotic thing. But you have to remember, no one had ever seen these places before. So the first time anyone ever saw a picture of Japan, for many Americans, was in National Geographic, right? And over time, I think we've done a much better job of representing a more accurate picture of the world. And that's only going to happen by completing a, tour, a trip we're on now to decentralize our editorial work and our grant making work, which is something I did at Sesame Street with my colleagues in a very successful way by launching programs, as, as was mentioned before, in places like Egypt and Israel and Northern Ireland and Russia and India. And these shows were not just the US show being translated into Hindi. It was an Indian show, Gali Gali Sim Sim, with kids who looked like me, talked like me, had my sense of humor, and understood what it was about. But it was taking the values of Sesame Street and the technology of Sesame Street and putting it into a local contextualized framework. And that's exactly what we are doing now in National Geographic with 41 local language editions and partners in all those <coughs> countries I mentioned and many more who are able to represent the world uh, in, that, in, that, in that decentralized context. That's the answer to your question. So we're, we're not done, but we're on this trip together. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> OK. <laughs>
him to sensationalize. Um, you know, you talked about how the media now is getting very different. And, you know, if you think about it, while a 15-page piece in National Geographic discussing the ivory trade may give you an extraordinary contextualized window into really what's going on, in terms of a room like this, something that's going to be totally much more impactful in terms of motivating somebody is simply a picture of an elephant without its tusks. Yep. Um, but at the same time, that's not really telling the whole story as well as that massive article might. Yep. So I'm wondering kind of when you're thinking about things from National Geographic's perspective, when you're trying to get the messaging out, where the line is drawn between what catches the eye and what tells the story. Yeah, well, that's a really good question. And there's not an, there's not an answer to that question. But it's what our editors sort through every single day. And it goes to also when you throw in the changing disruptive platforms, I mean, Snapchat didn't exist 18 months ago or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. 19 months. So, and now it's like a platform everyone's on all day long, right? So, so is having that picture of that elephant in a Snapchat environment uh, going to change the world? Maybe, right? Is a 15-page article about the ivory trade going to change the world? Maybe. It, different people need different media. And my view is uh, we, we have to be platform agnostic. And it's not one or the other, it's all of the above. And one of the things I'm trying to do is actually look at issues like oceans and wildlife, the wildlife trade, and the fight for the world's antiquities, which we're reading about in a horrible way in the week's news of the past figuring out ways in which we can 360 this so that we can do it in all these different media, whether it's a large screen IMAX film or whether it's an educational app in a classroom. But we've got to be in all these places using the National Geographic yellow rectangle. That's, that's our goal. So it's not, it's not an either or, it's all the above. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi there. Hi. Nice to meet you today. Sure. Uh, my question is, so I'm a huge believer in traveling, being viable myself, and just wondering what your favorite Yeah, so I added up, I, I, I think I've been to like 75 countries or something like that now, and um, it's hard to pick out one that was the best, but uh, one that was the most different was going to Antarctica. <laughs> and I saw a lot of penguins, <laughs> millions of penguins, I have to say, doing penguin things. <laughs> so. And then leopard seals eating penguins. So, so, but what was so moving about Antarctica, and I was just down there about 18 months ago, was uh, it's the cl I felt being down there was the closest thing that I ever I would ever experience to being in outer space, because there's an isolation and it's pretty much pristine, pretty much, and you sit down there and you think about. You're at the South Pole, or close to it, and you look this way, that way, that way, that way, and you think about the chaos in the world above you, whichever way you, you point. And it's one of these moments that you, uh, you just sort of take in, uh, and it makes the world a very small place. It's sort of like that picture that Neil Armstrong, the astronaut, would always show about the, the the blue earth from outer space, and it's just this ball in the solar system. And it was that, that kind of an experience going to Antarctica. So it moved me in a, in a profound way. Thanks, thanks. And National Geographic runs trips to Antarctica. Let's see if we, see if we can figure out how to turn this on. Try it. It says on. Hello? There awesome. we go. All right. There we go. All right. I can repeat uh, the question. Go ahead. Yours is cutting right now. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, my question has to do with um, new media. So I've always seen National Geographic's bread and butter as the elegance and the artistry of the articles. And I was wondering how you feel that new media might be forcing a change in National Geographic's personality, and if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, that's a, is this on? It doesn't sound like it. It doesn't 
sound like this one's off. So. We can solve this. Mine's working fine. So you take mine. Speaking of new technology, <laughs> microphone. Um, well, I, it, it, you know, that, that's a good question as well whether it's going to change the character of National Geographic, which has tried to stand for uh, giving a context to the news and letting you step back from the things you hear about all day long and being able to look at something different. So the Hubble telescope anniversary is the cover story of the April issue. And you're probably, probably not, unless you're an astronomy major, thinking about the Hubble every day walking around campus. But you know what, if you spend 20 minutes with that story online, uh, you'll really think about stuff. So to me, these new digital applications are gifts because they can take these stories which used to only be in print and do fantastic video, do fantastic geo mapping, uh, do uh, beautifully rendered photography that comes across like pop on digital that, did, that doesn't quite pop as well in, in a print magazine. So I view these as a blessing, actually. And uh, the, the question is, is how do you, from running the company, how do you get people who were born, lived, grew their entire careers in a print environment to now become thinking like digital natives, right? So you guys all get this, but I have to lecture all the time to people my age about the fact, I always talk about my grandmother who, who was obsessed with the refrigerator, you know? Because it was like, oh, the ice box, look at this thing, it's amazing. And I never thought about the refrigerator. It was like, you know, it's an appliance, whatever. <laughs> So you guys look at all these iPhones and iPads and iShmads and everything else as, you know, these appliances. I mean, and we look at them, it's kind of like, holy cow, look what this does. And, rah, rah. and it's kind of like, it's part of your life. You grew up with it, right? So it's like to message to adults, get over it, you know? It's kind of like, this is the world. Let's figure out how to use these tools to change, to make an impact on the world and teach people about the Hubble or what's happening with Iraq or whatever the issue is using these new technologies. We gotta hire people who get it. So message to the applicants back there. You know, we do, we do hire new people, not all the time, but you know, we have to have people who understand this world. And this whole world of geomapping is a whole nother one. I know the geography department here does work in ge geographic information systems. This area is exploding right now with technology and it's the most exciting thing ever to happen, geography. So we, 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 we need to be there. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Uh, I'm curious where National Geographic stands on risk for your photographers and athletes. Well, mostly photographers. Cliff Bar recently dumped some athletes because of their engagement in two high levels of risk. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, we have some guys who, and gals, not just guys, who uh, take risks. We promoted adventure and uh, we do what we can to support those who are not insane. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, part of the whole exploration gene is taking risks. And I, I don't know enough about the Cliff Bar facts to say whether they were right or wrong about that. But, uh, you know, we've, we've had people who, in the past, who were climbing Everest and who were doing things, and it didn't end well. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I think you can't have a risk-free uh, commitment to adventure and uh, exploration. It just doesn't exist. And some of the great explorers of the world, like Shackleton in Antarctica, ended up in a bad place. But I think 100 years later, we still remember him, right? And National Geographic uh, reported on that and, and is working now on celebrating the 100th anniversary of his trek across Antarctica, which, which business schools, I think, still teach, right, as team building exercises. So um, 
So you know, we want to be prudent, but uh, we also believe that we've got to support people who want to step out of the box, box and take risks, which benefit all of us. I work for a teen travel and immersion company, and we lose a lot of our potential customers to your National uh -oh. Geographic trips. Um, so I'm asking, what, in your opinion, sets your trips and your expeditions apart, and then what trip would you want to go on most yeah. out of everyone you offer? Well, you should partner with us. That's the all right. So, uh, so we've launched a we have a travel expedition business that's growing, actually. A lot of people are out there at different segments of parts of their lives, retired people, people who are mid-career, people with families, teenagers who want to discover the world. It's much easier to, uh, to uh, travel the world than ever. Um, so um, I think what we try to do is curate these trips with experts who really understand actually what's going down in Rwanda with gorillas, as in the animals, gorillas, um, or what's happening around antiquities uh, in Egypt or whatever. So we're able to bring that, I think, quality and expertise to an experience that people apparently value. Um, I, you know, the world is a learning opportunity, and there is a difference, as someone explained to me, between tour a tourist and a traveler. If you think about that. So it's not just about tourism as a passive experience. People want to be active travelers. And those are the people who, who uh, find National Geographic appealing. So uh, you know, I was just in Turkey in actually over Thanksgiving having turkey. <laughs> so and, uh, and it wasn't very good either over there. But it was, but the Turkish food is wonderful. But we had one of our guides in Istanbul, and you know who lives in Istanbul, and we got an insider's view of what's happening, and it was a fantastic experience, right? So, uh, where I'd like to go, I mean, that that's a good question. I mean, I, I think there are uh, there's uh, parts of Asia that I haven't been to, like Myanmar, who which has just opened up and uh, is quite special, I think. So that's one place I'd, I'd be interested in going. Thanks. Hi. Hello. Um, when I'm looking at the news, a lot of the time my favorite stories are coming right from the source. So the woman who drove from Yemen into Saudi Arabia, her story went out directly from her. Yeah. And I'm a researcher in the geography department, so thanks for shouting out to us. Um, so how does National Geographic want to incorporate that mm. trend that's coming, the story's coming straight from the source, mm. and also maybe researchers trying to incorporate that too, not just from our voice and our analysis, but here's the story right from the source. Yeah, good, good question. Um, the, uh, you guys should all check out the Out of Eden Walk. All right, I don't know if anybody knows about this. This is very cool. So we have a journalist named Paul Salpek, who's a nut. But he's, he's a, a great guy. He's currently in Tbilisi, Georgia. He is walking for seven years from the, sort of the heart of humanity in Ethiopia all the way across the Middle East, across Asia, down Alaska, all the way down to Chile Okay, for seven years. This is sort of the, the, the footsteps of, of humankind, the, mi the great migration. He's now in year two. Uh, he blogs every three days directly from the source. And this is some of the most moving stuff you've ever seen. And he has, it's on our website. He has his own website. He's got a huge fan club. He's on Facebook and Twitter and everything else. The Knight Foundation gave him money to support slow journalism. That's what we call this. <clears throat> and I think part of, part of the wonder of new technology is being able to give us this ability for blogs and the ability to uh, have these eyewitness sources of, of information. Now, I, with that said, I'm also a big believer in journalism with a capital J. 
and I have to say this on behalf of the communication school at UT, but journalism's really important. And news, the name news has gotten a bad rap somewhat, I think, because it's really about, uh, there, are, there are differences between facts and opinions. The lights are on as a fact, it's not really my opinion. So there are, th and we have to be a little clear on what those things are in, and there are people who can, who can uh, source that information, fact check the information, fact check it again, edit it, there is a role for that, right? It's different from having an eyewitness account, uh, but you've got to have a trusted source who's like Paul, who's traveling the world. I know he's writing those things, but you've got to make sure you've got someone who knows that he's writing those things working for you, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it is important that there are trusted voices and some sort of an editing system of curation um, so that we can rely on factual information to make critical decisions as we make as voters or people who participate in political processes, that's also important as well. And create a successful brand like National Geographic yeah. that everyone trusts. Well, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much for all of your wonderful questions. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time. Um, and at this moment, I would like to thank uh, you very much, Dean Platt and Mr. Nell, for your, uh, taking time out of, out of your busy schedule to speak with our you. students. I know that we've been uh, be able to take your lessons and apply them into our own lives and take all the very interesting facts that you have shown us today. As a token of our appreciation, the Undergraduate Business Council would like to present Mr. Nell with this personalized Stetson Cowboy hat oh in recognition <laughs> of his participation in the BIP Distinguished Speaker Series. All right. Excellent. Woo -hoo. <laughs> Great. <Excellent>. Good. <laughs> All right. All right, I do have one thing for the dean here, and in appreciation of National Geographic, our, our chief content officer, Chris Johns, uh, has uh, printed out this beautiful picture of an African lion, this photo from 1987 that we want to present to the School of Business. That's really beautiful. Thank, thank you, you for so Thank you for all you've done. Wonderful. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>